the stream. And uh, we're open in now, so just thank you for allowing us that time. I'm uh, Jim Costick, and um, I'm one of the founders of Green Spaces Alliance, um, which is a local land trust, deals with land conservation, uh, urban land and water um, projects such as community gardens and then youth photography. Um, I'm on one of the uh, task forces for the Mayor's Commission on Affordable Housing. Uh, indeed, it is an extremely complicated topic. And um, uh, you mentioned your work. And uh, so our, at least my hope is that uh, now that the horse has gotten out of the barn, uh, that we might address some of the issues that deal with your project and with the soap works and so on. And I'm a member of the Planning Commission. Um, I've dealt with neighborhoods a lot. Um, uh, NIMBY is real. It is real. People do hate change. <laughs> and uh, so, in an urban setting, I think the, the task is how to deal with the fact uh, that people do hate change, and how are we going to accommodate for that so that people are educated and willing to accept the kind of changes that are really beneficial for all of us. And I think it's a very difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and um, for Welcome introducing yourselves. Um, I'm hoping that we can do a lot more um, conversation and presentation today. Um, so I want to be as brief as I can, which is a challenge for me, but um, I want to be as brief as I can in just letting you know a little bit more about what happened at Mission Trails and um, kind of bring us to uh, another moment where housing and, and climate justice are, are um, you know, meet as well that, that Jim mentioned, um, the Soapworks and Town Center apartments. Um, so I am born and raised in the southeast side of San Antonio, and it is um, the area that was just, um, uh, that, that includes most of the missions that were um, you know, promoted in the UNESCO designation. And um, for a lot of people you know, in, in that area, um, many of us are descendants of the peoples um, who were, you know, whose labor and lives were absolutely exploited in the building of those missions. And um, a lot of the displacement that's happening today um, is a direct, um, it's a direct continuation of the genocide and colonization that occurred since then, right? It just takes these different shapes as time goes by and now it's called gentrification. Um, we don't always make those connections to that time, um, but uh, some do, thank goodness. <laughs> some do insist and persist and um, make sure that we continue to hold that reality as a very you know, present, um, uh, reality as well, right? It's not just history, it's not just looking back, there is still very much to learn from, from what happened and to understand that's how we got here today. Um, so um, along the, uh, the promotion of, of the missions as a UNESCO, as UNESCO sites, um, along with that, one of the major projects that um, has come up is also um, promotion and many of us would say exploitation of the river, the San Antonio River. Um, that's been going on for, you know, for a really long time and most recently, um, you know, has been used as a way to promote tourism, right? And with um, the, you know, the, the big reason for it always is that it's such an economic, uh, uh, spur, right? It's, it's going to help us, it's going to save us, it's going to pull us out of poverty, it's going to, you know, bring us really, you know, jobs that we need, um, all of those things, but I think often 
those uh, those points are not complicated enough, are not teased out enough. You know, what kinds of jobs does that bring in? What kind of economic mobility are we really talking about and for whom, right? Um, so uh, again, a lot of that um, promotion around the, the river has been focused around downtown for a long time, and then in recent years um, has started to grow north and southward, right? And there was the uh, museum reach um, going north and the mission reach going south again towards southeast side where I'm from and into um, the area where Mission Trails mobile home community um, was. That, um, the way I came into kind of crashed into, you know, really looking at the, the connections between climate justice and housing justice is through um, the situation that occurred at Mission Trails which was, um, you know, like I mentioned, uh, the, the mission reach was um, expanding and growing, you know, the, the river was being um, developed, and um, the idea was that the development around it would um, create more access. Again, access for whom? Um, you know, well, I'll say that. So, um, so as that happened, um, one of the things that we started to see, you know, resulting from that um, was that uh, people that lived right along the river um, were starting to be squeezed out in different ways. And um, we saw it in a really huge way with Mission Trails because that was a mobile home community, so people did not own the land which they lived on. Um, one of the things that comes up also with the mobile home community is that they were in fact homeowners. The majority were homeowners. They, they owned their home. They just didn't own the land that the home sat on. And um, when, this, when this situation first came up that through a zoning change, um, the, uh, the, the residents of the mobile home park were going to be removed. Um, and they weren't going to be removed to, um, with the possibility of moving back and enjoying the new apartments or the new development that was gonna come up. I mean, they were being removed to go wherever they could scurry off to because um, what was coming in were high dollar luxury apartments overlooking the river, right? Um, so uh, when I first came into Mission Trails Mobile Home Community, I was invited as um, just a general community um, advocate, and um, I was asked to help out with a tenants meeting um, to do translation, because many people that lived there um, spoke only Spanish. Um, and there was also um, the issue around communication that people didn't know what was going on. They saw you know, a little yellow sign at the front of the, of the park, and um, had you know tried to look for answers and, and hadn't really gotten any. So the situation was unclear, but it was very definitely scary. Um, and uh, people organizing and supporting the tenants wanted to make sure that that everyone understood um, the content of the meeting. And um, so, and one of those people was Marisol that Greg um, mentioned. So they invited me to help out with translating and. Um, I went and I helped translate, you know, during the, during the meeting as I was leaving um, and I thought I would only be back to help translate again because I was um, feeling really overwhelmed with the other work that I do in community as often happens and um, I was, um, you know, trying to stay really focused on, on that work and not extend my, you know, overextend myself but I did feel this tug because it was, it was my area, right? It was, it was my home too. Um, and I didn't even, I didn't even know how much it was my home, you know, until I, I started to, to get to know people there a little bit more. But um, I've lived in that area and I never knew that that mobile home park existed then. Um, and I had actually worked, uh, like several years before that, I had worked just a couple, a block down from there. And, you know, there's like a privacy fence and I just had not noticed, I didn't know, I didn't know there was a mobile home park there. And I had my own idea about what a mobile home um, was, like how long people live there. I thought that was more of a, 
um, in the meantime type of living situation. I just had that general assumption. And that first day on my way out, I stopped and talked to um, one of the people that lived there. And she told me that she had lived there 37 years. And that absolutely floored me. I just, I had no idea. And that year, I, was, I had just turned 37 years old. So <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, so she's lived this long here. She had raised you know, her son. She had raised her grandchildren there. And I got to know her a little bit better and, and you know, understand how, you know, how, yeah, that actually could be my home. <laughs> and, um, you know, what's gonna happen as this wave of whatever this is because I didn't understand it fully then but you know how is this going to ripple out to my home right um, to my parents home to um, my neighbors my friends home so that was um, you know kind of thrust me into a space of really thinking about um, the beauty the value the the significance of our river, you know, because people that live there too, um, you know, this woman, Mary, talked about um, going down to the river and fishing with her, with her sons, with her grandsons. There was um, uh, other people in the, in the mobile home community talked about having taken care of the river um, for all the years that they lived there. Um, you know, as I, I came to find out that many other people had lived there for a really long time. Um, and uh, so that just really struck me how connected they felt to that river, the um, not, you know, not ownership in the traditional sense, but the, the part, they felt a part of that river and a responsibility to it. And this development that was happening around the river just felt like such a betrayal, you know? Um, not of the river, but this space that they felt so, so physically connected to um, was, you know, changing in a way that was literally physically pushing them out. And pushing them out to, you know, the unknown. Because the other thing that um, Mission Trails really brought up for our community and, um, and for City Hall is that, you know, the city is not equipped, is not ready to really meet the needs to address these growing pains. We talk about growth, right? About the 1.5 million and all of that and the you know, buildings and innovations coming, but we don't talk about you know, how, what, what the growing pains to all of that is gonna be and, and this was a really, a really huge one. So, um, so those were some things that, that came together. Um, as a few more people came to support the residents there, um, I remember um, one good friend was talking to people, you know, trying to connect them to come and support the, the residents there. And um, she came one day really upset because she had talked to a longtime environmentalist and told her what was happening. You know, there's this Mission Reach development, it's having this impact on people that have lived there for decades. Um, you know, what do you think? Can you come help out? Because the Mission Reach was also being promoted as, you know, a, a green innovation as well, right? With conservation of the river and na using only native plants and uh, all of those things as they laid down a bunch of concrete through it. But so again, even within itself, it had all these conflicting <laughs> ideas too. But, um, you know, it was being promoted as a good green step forward in our community in the southeast side. And, um, you know, again, it, it was having this impact on, on the community right there, where when, when she told this environmentalist about it, um, she said, as long as they're not building over the aquifer, I, I, I don't care. And that really kind of hurt us, you know, but also really struck us about how, um, you know, how, how, solid these silos are that we work in you know sometimes in the in the um, community advocacy or social justice or you know activism communities you know how how dangerous and limiting those silos can be and and how hurtful because how can you say it doesn't matter if you know neighborhoods are being impacted by what's going on um, 
you know, it, it, at the river. So, um, so those are some of the things that, that, that came up for me that really brought the two kind of, um, you know, uh, crashing into each other and then also a renewed, you know, thinking and reflection on what is home and, um, you know, going beyond not just structures and not just environment, but just the melding of all of that and um, the relationships that we have not only to each other, our neighbors and people that live, you know, near us, but also the land and the space and the air and the trees that we, that we share and um, witnessing that displacement, I, I could literally see people like, you know, being torn apart from those connections. And that was um, terrible to see. And of course, I can only imagine, you know, so much worse to actually go through. And um, there were some families that lived there that had, um, you know, those community networks that, that they relied on. Um, that were, you know, broken up, so they didn't have an, another support network to go to. You know, there wasn't always another sofa to, to surf for a while or, you know, some other transition, you know, um, arrangement. Um, and uh, some families um, had several members that lived in the mobile home park. So, you know, we couldn't go and stay with, you know, the... Uh, so and so because she was also having to uproot, move everything, pack the kids, and find where to, to live. Um, space, and um, it also reflected all these other issues that San Antonio is, um, that City Hall is now making attempts to deal with. Where were these families gonna go? That was a naturally affordable housing um, situation there at the mobile home community, and um, it wasn't subsidized, it wasn't you know, public housing, it was a naturally affordable housing. Um, and it was being broken up, destroyed, and now where were people gonna go? They couldn't find affordable housing in the, you know, in the same area because again, that Mission Reach development was coming and property taxes, you know, property um, values are starting to rise and spike and um, all of those growing pains, right, are, are hitting. So um, fast forward, I guess, four years, three years. Well, no, I'm sorry, let's stay there a second. <laughs> Initially, um, what did come up after the city council um, approved in a six to four vote, they approved the rezoning that would um, uh, finalize you know, the, the sale of the, of the mobile home parks, of the mobile home park. And, um, and people started to move. The city saw you know, um, how hard it was to accommodate that number of, of people having to move at once. And um, city council also saw you know, there, what's, what's going on, right? Maybe we should try to get ahead of this so that it doesn't happen again. Um, the mayor at that time was Julian Castro and he created an initial um, task force the name of it was um, the uh, Mayor's Task Force to Preserve Dynamic and Diverse Neighborhoods. And um, the intention was to look at mission trails and make sure that it didn't happen again. And, um, you know, keeping in mind that Mission Reach, you know, is, is, on, is on the move, that, you know, San Antonio is growing, you know, again, how do we mitigate the, the um, the effects of that growth and how do we make sure that displacement does not occur. Um, that task force, unfortunately, was um, heavily staffed and directed by city staff. And it took a direction that um, a lot of us feel was not, you know, lost connection with the community it was supposed to, to serve and with the, the, its original purpose. Um, that task force released a report of recommendations to city council. There were two dissent, there was a 15 member task force and there were two dissenting um, opinions on there. 
and they were the two um, most community-based uh, representatives on that task force, so that, that says something. <laughs> and um, the rest of the members were housing professionals, and there were two or three um, council members on the task force. So after that, a housing commission was created, and that was another 15 members of a huge, you know, a large majority um, housing professional, professionals, housing uh, developers, and very few community representatives. Um, that housing commission has been in, a, in um, operating now for the last um, three years, and um, it's been a very slow process at moving towards, you know, working on the, the recommendations of the original task force. Um, can Mayor, I, can uh -huh. I comment sure. uh, on the phase she's talking about now? So there is this group, and uh, as you said, a lot of it really though are uh, affordable housing providers mm -hmm. of this group. And the gist of it is uh, they, uh, they need to build as cheaply as they can because their product is only going to be sold or rented for X amount of money. So uh, they are proposing things like uh, uh, not um, uh, um, using, having to comply with the same regulations that other development has. Uh, for example, trees, uh, not required to uh, abide by the tree ordinance. And the ordinance is supposed to be set up to uh, provide some limited environmental quality. So if a low-income developer doesn't have to uh, plant trees for those that are removed, what does that do? So I mean, that's an example of the conflict mm -hmm. that occurs when you're trying to provide affordable housing. Uh, do you, uh, uh, I mean, doesn't everyone deserve a tree, a tree? <laughs> or is uh, that poor people don't deserve trees because it can't be afforded. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing the city, I think, really needs to work on, mm -hmm. is how they're going to provide the same provisions for environmental quality. Right, and um, there is a task force now that's been developed to further some of that work of the Housing Commission and, and kind of go deeper into those other, you know, connecting pieces between other issues that affect housing um, uh, inequality and a housing crisis that is, you know, um, placing a big, a huge strain on, on, on working families, right? Because there isn't enough affordable housing existing in San Antonio um, currently. And um, because as we grow and promote the city, we keep, um, you know, that, that continues to cost us affordable housing. Um, so right now, that's the, the other um, situation that we've run into is that, um, again, Mission Reach was going south and now going north, just, um, just north of downtown, there are another, um, there's another space of naturally affordable housing that's been there for decades. These are apartment complexes. It's so forth in town center. And um, that property has now been bought and sold. Um, that property value has risen because of its proximity to the, because it is overlooking the San Pedro Creek. The San Pedro Creek project is, an, uh, you know, the northern extension of, of the Mission Reach. The same idea that now they'll connect the creek to the San Antonio River and, you know, create this um, on this experience for um, the tourists to move through San Antonio and understand who we are, where we come from, where we want to go by walking through um, that development. And um, you know, those that prop that stress on property values is now um, causing people in those apartments to feel squeezed out. Um, some fees are start. Have, there's a new owner, a uh, new management company, and um, they're starting to to charge additional fees. 
they um, are working on remodeling units at the apartments. So there's a lot of construction in addition to all the construction around the creek project. So um, they've seen you know rise in um, roaches, rats, um, uh, hazards you know throughout the complex. People with a walker or in a wheelchair are unable to get through you know the little paths because there's um, paint and lumber and all kinds of construction stuff but in the way. Um, and so they're not evicting people, but they're squeezing them out. Mm -hmm. So the new Affordable Housing Task Force is trying to address this issue of gentrification. Uh, but one of the issues is the uh, uh, state legislation. For example, in New York City, you can have rent controls. Uh, I don't think you can do it in San Antonio because of the state legislation that prevents it. And, and the pervasive attitude of the state legislature now is to make certain that uh, local initiatives cannot be carried out. They want to pre preempt all of these. And so that mm -hmm. is a huge issue uh, for any municipality. Right. But uh, uh, I think that the task forces are trying to address uh, the gentrification issue I mean, and they recognize that NIMBY is a big issue. Um, I don't think they've uh, solved it because maybe it can't be solved. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just have to spend the time to deal with it. And, that, and so it would be very nice if there were uh, neighborhoods like there are associations like Dignity Hill who actually tried to address it and spent some time dealing with it. But uh, uh, neighborhood associations are not particularly strong. So that's the reality. Mm -hmm. Can I spend a time check? It's a, right, it's 11 o'clock. I know we're a little behind, but there was obviously a question. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the help. OK, thank you. Yeah, do you all have questions or any? comments or it's a lot to take in I'm um, I really appreciate that you are not from here and are taking time to understand where here is because I don't think that happens enough um, and I do think that it has major implications on our community you know um, yeah um, so just, just as kind of like not as grounded in this work as, as Jessica, but um, as someone who's approached it a little more tentatively and had my own conflicts about, you know, I always go back to my reflexes, the market says, you know, or, or what's the law say, or all this kind of stuff. And, um, but one of the things I've been struck by recently as I talk to more and more people, and certainly I've been talking with folks at Soapworks, is I think that there's, 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 there's something about and doing some interviews actually with other people who have been displaced from like Cement Town, which was where the Alamo Quarry is now, or, or Hemisphere, or some of these places. I didn't realize that was just the 1980s, right? Um, but these people described their lives, you know, entire lives lived in place, right? And the relationships they have with their neighbors and with other families, and, these, and they'll tell you their whole life stories and how they interlapped and these tapestries of relationships. I've grown up, I was born in 1970, and as I grew up as a professional in the 90s or whatever, it's like, I moved all the time. You move for a job. You don't have the, you know, I, ne I absolutely didn't have that experience growing up. Um, but my great-grandparents did, you know, and so this idea of place is really pretty profound, and particularly in regards to mental health. And I think that the more people I talk to that are in these uh, displacement scenarios, you hear it, even if they don't know how to tell you, in the course of a conversation, they'll tell you about how awful they feel, long time lingering depression, they develop panic disorders. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that comes out. And, I, and I'll say this, you know, to I'll express it to Jessica and say, yeah, that's, you know, but it's, it's not, for me, a near, knee jerk understanding, you know, of this process. It's like the long term ramifications of just being forced from your home and out of a, a, a kind of a life living by the river, having a relationship with the river in place. So then you get into like the theories of the rights of nature, rights to the city, you know, is housing a human right, and all of these questions. So it's a really interesting conversation, so I really appreciate you bringing it here. I, wish I, I 
told you all that was long winded. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't. It's always hard to gauge how much background to give. But I just, I think there's so many really critical roles, you know, in, in what's happened. Right? There's the role of the community that has made, you know, the that has made that space, that area, what it is today, and and has contributed so much to the value that's only now being recognized, but it's being recognized in a certain way and then, you know, um, communicated in, in this other way, exploited often, right? And and then for that to come back and, and affect people in a way that they're, they now have to be removed from that space is just really, um, that it's just, I, I think it's unacceptable. I mean, people will say it's inevitable, but there's a better way to do it, you know? Everybody out of the pool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.